So I have an outline as to go through the current um, pharmacological basis of the research. So there are treatments, everybody know about them. They are not really very effective at the moment. So we are looking for better treatments. <clears throat> And, um, and I'll give you a little bit background of why we're doing the things that we are doing. And um, the outcomes has been basically disappointing, except one, which I'm going to bring up uh, in the discussion, and uh, how we're going to improve that and how biomarkers will come into play, and also some of the non-pharmacological treatment I'm involved in in the research. So I, I don't need to go into details. Um, since uh, Alois Alzheimer's has described the disease, it was focused on two things, the amyloid plaques and the uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And uh, on top, uh, the slide shows these uh, pinkish areas as the glob of protein of amyloid accumulating. And this is another stain, silver stain, that shows these uh, amyloid plaques. And then in, below is inside the nerve cells. And these uh, fibers in the nerve cells become uh, abnormal, and they are the tau neurofibrillary tangles. And these are the two main targets that scientists have been working on to try and reverse the disease process. And uh, from all the genetic studies, we all know that um, the uh, major mutation that causes Alzheimer's disease increases amyloid production. So there are different mutations that cut the uh, protein here or there, but the result is that this little uh, segment of the protein is the 42 amino acids that becomes aggregated, and then that forms the amyloid plaques over time. And uh, the two major targets that people are working on are the uh, base, which is an uh, enzyme inhibitor. So hopefully, if we can inhibit the enzymes that cut this uh, protein, maybe we can slow down the process. And another um, uh, product that people work on are the monoclonal antibodies. They are highly specific, and they can be uh, designed to bind the protein specifically. And the goal is perhaps if you bind them and remove them from the brain, then maybe people don't accumulate this in the brain. And uh, very briefly, the tau hypothesis, uh, tau is kind of like a train track in tr inside the nerve cells. They are transporters of nutrients back and forth to the cells inside the axons. And uh, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the tau, um, which is uh, kind of the screws of the train tracks, um, get loosened. And uh, when the train tracks fall apart, the nutrients couldn't get back and forth inside the cell. And that leads to uh, problems inside the cell and eventually cell death. So another way to um, possibly combat the disease is to focus on tau. And maybe if you can stabilize these train tracks, then the nerve cells can become healthy again. And uh, one of the current studies that uh, UBC is involved in is uh, a protein, uh, or actually a uh, molecule that binds the uh, tau protein with the hope that it will stop the accumulation. Um, there are many other new targets that came out in the last five years, and I'm not going to into details. But you may read from the literature that there are large scales um, genetic um, uh, uh, association studies that have shown um, evidence another gene has been discovered that is associated with Alzheimer's disease. But um, generally, they fall into three main categories. Uh, the first one is the APOE that has been around the longest, and it's related to fat and cholesterol metabolism, and then a few new ones that are also associated to fat and cholesterol metabolism. A number of the new ones are related to membrane remodeling and trafficking inside the cell. And uh, the uh, third category, again, uh, interestingly, the uh, concept of inflammation has been around for many years. And then there are now some new studies suggesting that, indeed, inflammation is involved in brain and neurodegenerative diseases. So these are exciting targets, but I'm not going to go into details anymore. This is another more for the model of how A beta and the tau interact can lead to disease. And then there are some new targets that we're looking at this interaction and probably uh, with the hope uh, to slow down the disease process. 
So uh, other than the classical targets, there are many new targets that people are working on, um, mostly still in the uh, cellular and uh, animal models, but a few of them are now making into the clinical trials now. So some of them are in the early phase one clinical trials, um, trying to see if there's actually any benefit in humans. And uh, this is a complicated slide just to show you that um, while we learned a lot about Alzheimer's disease to date, um, there are still many unknowns. There are some clues as to how Alzheimer's disease develop and eventually there will be cell death and dementia. And in the beginning, we know that there's increased amyloid production or increased abnormal tau, but somewhere in between this is still unclear, we think that uh, amyloid, excessive amyloid, will aggregate and leads to plaques. But uh, whether that is actually a significant st step that leads to cell death is still unclear. We also know that uh, too much tau and hyperphosphorylated tau is bad, but uh, whether that is a result versus is just a bystander or marker of disease is still unknown. And somewhere in between, we think that inflammation is also involved and cell death um, will uh, result in the disease. And uh, we have been involved in clinical trials uh, starting from um, Dr. Lynn Beatty almost uh, 30, 40 years ago. But, um, but uh, unfortunately, in the last 10 years or so, things have been very slow and disappointing. It's not because we're not doing studies. In fact, there has been over 400 uh, clinical trials registered in the last 15 years. But unfortunately, none of them has been positive. And I would just very quickly point to what we have been involved in in UBC. We have been involved in a number of the um, base inhibitor, but they have been negative. And uh, we are also involved in these monoclonal antibodies, and uh, some of them are naturally occurring antibodies. That's the IVIG. And uh, most of them have been negative. Although, if you look at subgroup analysis, some of them do have po uh, bo positive uh, borderline results, but uh, when, when we do a clinical trial, we have to preset our um, uh, uh, outcome analysis. And if you change your outcome halfway, then you're kind of a data um, massage. So that is not really pro uh, appropriate for the uh, statistical analysis. But uh, there are some signals coming out, and I will briefly go into that. And there are some other uh, cl clinical trials that are ongoing at UBC. And uh, why aren't they working? There, as I mentioned, there are over 400 uh, clinical trials in the past 15 years or so. Um, then um, there are some new ideas or actually some insights that has come out with the analysis of these negative clinical trials. Uh, some argue, is it just because we didn't get the right drug or is it because we aren't doing the correct studies? And um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes to go through the, the potential arguments why these clinical trials are not working. First, um, maybe we don't have the right drug target. Um, uh, amyloid, it's a, a step that initiate uh, all the disease, but it may not be the final common pathway. So that is one of the current argument why some of the amyloid treatment is not working. Um, the wrong drug, and that is obvious, if the drug is not working well, um, it may not be the actual mechanism of the drug, but it could be the properties of the drug. Uh, as I will mention to you, some of them, why, why some of them are not working. Um, some now argue that it's the wrong measurement. Maybe we're not actually following the patients uh, properly so that we're not detecting the changes that people benefit from the treatment. And then finally, the wrong patients. And what I mean by that, I'll go into that. It could be Alzheimer's disease is actually many different diseases, and um, we are only uh, grouping them all together. But if um, and we may actually have to separate out them into different groups in order to target the appropriate treatment properly. So the argument for the wrong target is that um, uh, now that we have better biomarkers, we know that um, these um, amyloid that shows up in PET scans occur um, 
a long time before the onset of Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, if we also look at um, the healthy population over 70 or 75, up to one third of these people also have positive amyloid PET scans. Um, there are two different uh, stream of arguments. One is that maybe these amyloid are just benign and then there are some other disease process that lead to the development of dementia. The other uh, school of thought is that, well, these people are actually at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. If you watch them for another 10 to 15 years, they will develop Alzheimer's disease. Uh, those studies are being done, so hopefully within another few years we will have enough longitude no data to know who is correct in that argument. But, uh, but we always uh, kind of uh, focus on amyloid and forgot about tau. And uh, these are the pictures to show you that tau is another disease process. And in pathological studies, tau pathology actually follows um, the amount of cognitive impairment much more closely than amyloid deposits. So there are people with lots of amyloid deposits who are actually very mild and they're still doing fairly well. Whereas when you have a lot of tau deposits, they always do badly. Are we using the wrong drug? And uh, some of the uh, data from the clinical trials uh, coming up um, shows that indeed um, it was probably just a bad uh, design. Um, one of the study drugs that we have been involved in uh, shows that it works very well in animal models, but it doesn't work in human. And when we do human biomarker studies, the drug actually doesn't get through to the CSF very well. So it works in the, the bloodstream, but it doesn't work inside the brain. So maybe it, that's why it's a failed drug. Another uh, gamma secretase uh, from another drug company has uh, uh, really bad side effects. So that study uh, was stopped early um, because um, halfway through they are seeing a separation in the treated and the untreated group. But it's, uh, unfortunately, it's the treated group that got worse in this un untreated group that is more stable. So that one is, just shows that it has a lot of side effects. And what about the monoclonal antibodies? Um, that one is more complex. And I will go through that in the following slides. Um, what about the measurements? When we look at uh, measuring outcome in a uh, dementia clinical trial, we usually have to use some cognitive measures. But most of these measures have been around for a long time. Uh, uh, some of them are more complex. They are a complex set of uh, neuropsychological batteries. And some of them are fairly simple, like the ADAS cog is the most commonly used uh, outcome measure. It's mostly focused on memory. Um, but this scale is designed for people with uh, mild to moderate uh, Alzheimer's disease. And if they have any other type of cognitive impairment, like executive dysfunction, like visual spatial problems, it doesn't really measure that very well. Um, so maybe some of these scales are all too focused and we're not broad enough uh, to measure the uh, outcome. Uh, some of them are a more global measure, but they have also been around for a long time, more focused on Alzheimer's disease and are not really broad enough to measure many other activities of daily living. Um, on the other hand, if you have a very broad scale, maybe the measures are too general. And um, when you do statistical analysis, they are not strong enough to show the changes. So there are um, different school of thoughts of how to design better measurements um, in these clinical trials. And uh, finally, are we actually focusing on the wrong patients? So this um, uh, is one of the outcome published in the bapanuzumab. That's one of the monoclonal antibodies has um, been uh, going on for the last few years, being studied extensively. Um, it, both of them are kind of negative. So uh, if we look at the overall outcome, there's no difference in the treated versus on the, the, the placebo group. But um, some of them have uh, biomarkers, and um, that's just when the new PET scans have come about, and uh, they were applied in a fraction of the patients. But if we look at those who actually got the PET scan, they found out that um, a number of them, up to 36% uh, of them, do not have a positive amyloid PET scan. 
And we now know that these amyloid PET scans are pretty good at detecting amyloid changes in the brain. But if up to one third of them actually do not have this at the baseline, then maybe actually these people do not have Alzheimer's disease. They do have some form of dementia, maybe from vascular disease, maybe Lewy body disease. They look like Alzheimer's when we examine them, but pathologically, they may not actually have the amyloid changes in the brain. So if you lower their amyloid, they are not going to get better. So that's one of the argument that we are maybe treating the wrong patients. And uh, this is also our own study um, looking at uh, the pathological diagnosis of the patients who have participated in clinical trials. And we found that uh, while most of them do have some form of amyloid changes, uh, over half of them also have other pathology. The most common are stroke, uh, cerebrovascular disease, and uh, Lewy bodies. So another argument is that if they also have coexisting changes in the brain, even though you remove the amyloid, these other diseases are not going to get better, and that's why you have a negative clinical trial. Um, so this is another complicated slide showing the biomarker changes. I won't go through them, but it just shows that, that these biomarkers um, are positive somewhere between 10 to 15 years be before the actual onset of detectable cognitive changes. So um, people are perfectly doing fine, but uh, 10 to 15 years before they have the disease, we can already detect these biomarker changes. So the argument is that maybe we actually have to find these people earlier, because by the time you actually see their cognitive decline, a lot of disease have already set in, in the brain, and it's too late to do any uh, uh, benefits. I have briefly touched on why biomarkers are useful. Um, I will not go into all the details, but um, it's obvious that biomarkers can help to confirm the pathology if it is actually sensitive enough to pick that up. It will help to differentiate the many types of dementia. I didn't go into another of my topic of interest is actually mixed pathology, uh, dementia with mixed pathology. So sometimes dementia can have more than one cause um, and it's hard to separate them out without biomarkers. Um, and uh, finally, uh, how can we identify uh, earliest changes uh, before patients get too demented to be beneficial, to have beneficial effects? Um, this is a controversial topic. Um, I'll just touch on it um, and lead to some thoughts and discussion. Um, but it's useful to follow progress. And I already mentioned their spinal fluid and neuroimaging um, that are used as biomarkers. I won't go into much of the details of the MRI and specs because um, they tend to uh, follow people at the uh, later stages. Um, but at the early phase, they are really not very sensitive in detecting early changes. Spinal fluid markers have been around for about uh, 15 years. And now, um, if you look at any single study, most of these uh, biomarker studies show um, a very uh, clear uh, uh, high sensitivity and specificity for uh, diagnosing um, Alzheimer's changes in the brain. However, it's kind of invasive. Um, to me, it's not that bad because I'm the person here, but for the other person lying here, they don't like to have the needle put in their back. Um, if it's done correctly, you should pass through all the bones and just go into space. Um, then um, most people don't feel it. It's the people who are not very experienced, they will hit the bone, and they will bruise people, and they will hit a nerve, and that can be painful. And the caveat of using the biomarkers clinically at the moment is because um, right now, the biochemistry is still very tricky to perform. In a very well uh, uh, designed lab with a lot of experience, they can have a high reproducibility of the results uh, with, within two to three percent with uh, test reset changes. But if you compare site to site, if you 
uh, look at all the different sites that are actually doing biomarkers. They're still not very well standardized. It's kind of like the uh, INR in the early phase when people measure uh, blood uh, thinners. Uh, if your blood thinners are measured in different labs, they, they have different values, then the doctors will have to decide how to adjust the medications. But now they have an international normalized ratio, the INR. Now all the labs across the world are standardized. So we are in the process of trying to standardize uh, CSF measurements around the world. At least we want to standardize within Canada so that we can have a reference lab that can do it repetitively and give you re reliable results. And hopefully that will be out in a year or so. Um, some of the uh, arguments of that, there are some overlap between controls and MCI and AD, and I think that's still the argument. If we follow these people long enough, uh, maybe in another 10 to 15 years, will they actually have Alzheimer's? We don't know until we actually have all the longitudinal results out. Um, and I won't go into an MRI because um, they are not very sensitive. But if you see them, you can actually tell that there are certain parts of the brain shrinking. If you see them, it's very specific. But if you don't see it, it doesn't mean that there's no disease. Now I will go into the non-pharmacological treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, I've been involved in some exercise therapy studies um, that actually is uh, my colleague, Dr. Lou Ambrose, who did a lot of these studies. I'll be just quoting some of her findings. Lifestyle intervention and music therapy, another one of my studies that I've been involved in. In general, exercise uh, is beneficial. There are two types of exercise. The aerobic, those are the long distance walking, um, uh, just increasing your heart circulation and breathing. Whereas resistance training is um, actually you have to lift a little bit of weight and get your muscles to bulk up a bit. Um, which um, exercise is better? And um, the early evidence shows that both of them are useful. They are slightly different, but they are both useful. Um, probably the uh, aerobic exercises improve circulation, so it keeps the brain circulation healthy. Whereas if you do resistant exercise, there's actually some stimulation of the growth factors. So if your muscles grow, maybe these growth factors will also float into the brain and help to maintain some of the neurons in the brain as well. So uh, I won't go into the details, but the, uh, the summary is that uh, exercise is good for you. Um, the question is how much, and is actually not very much. For the aerobics, um, uh, Teresa calculated that uh, even if you do uh, 10 minutes per day, three times a week, so a total of 30 minutes a day of moderate uh, walking, and that's probably just walking briskly, uh, as fast as you can, not, not running, you don't have to jog, but walking briskly at least 10 minutes a day, three times a week is enough for the aerobic exercise. And for the uh, resistance exercise, for those who are not weight trainers, you don't have to go up to 100 pounds, just start from three pounds and then uh, do a bit more, but they do force people to go into fatigue. So if after lifting 10 times, 20 times, and you're still feeling fine, then you're not fatigued enough. So you have to start using more and more weight until after 10 to 15, oh, you're really tired. Then you have reached your target for that day. Do that three times a week, and that's probably enough for the exercise. Uh, this other one is a lifestyle intervention. That's a very big study going on in uh, Finland, and they look at uh, whether you can actually force the whole population into a lifestyle intervention. So they randomize people to just counseling them. They still give them the advice, but there's no follow-up. First, there's the more intense group. So the other intense group, they will actually check their diet and make sure that they are following their, their Mediterranean diet and uh, making sure that they are uh, having exercise. So they now have these uh, smartphone and uh, band that you can follow how much activity they are moving so they can track them. And they show that if you actually push them into the intense group, um, there is beneficial outcome. So the neuropsychological testing, there's some benefits. People are thinking better. They have uh, more um, reaction time. So it's worthwhile doing all these lifestyle intervention. Lastly, um, uh, music. Um, how does it actually work in uh, helping people? Um, that is a 
question that I don't have a full answer. I have some speculation, and my speculation is that music actually activates many different parts of the brain at the same time, whereas if you do a focus intervention, for example, an exercise training or mathematical training, you're only focusing on a very small part of the brain that trains you to do math or um, some aspects like uh, drawing, uh, drawing circles, it will get better if you do it a lot of practice, but um, it doesn't translate uh, into a lot of things. Whereas uh, music um, involves many parts of the brain, uh, including your memory of your life events, emotion, um, many other parts that could be beneficial. Um, I have uh, this result of a meta-analysis that is um, done by uh, a uh, student uh, who is also sitting here. He's now uh, graduated, but um, he helped me do this meta-analysis and go through all the results that has been shown. And uh, there are some benefits, not so much in cognition, so um, that may be a bit disappointing, so your memory doesn't get much better, but it does help in many other ways, such as anxiety, um, depression, aggressive behavior. When people um, uh, listen to music that they like, they tend to calm down. And uh, some of those studies also measure quality of life, but that hasn't been significant. We have done one of our own uh, with uh, help of uh, music therapists, uh, Kevin Kirkland and Susan Summers, and uh, it is a uh, randomized uh, block design. So we randomized people to have 12 weeks of music therapy versus waiting. So we tell the other group that they're going to get it later so that they don't try to treat themselves. So for the de delayed group, um, we tell them that they will get it, but they have to wait um, because we are randomized to a later group. So we compare the, the people who are waiting versus those who got treated. And uh, surprisingly, I actually also found a significant result. Uh, NPI is a neuropsychiatric in infantry. Um, it is a measure of various non neuropsychological symptoms, including uh, depression, anxiety, all those other psychiatric symptoms. And um, we did not see a global um, improvement because possibly this scale is a very crude scale, but uh, we actually also see a, a decrease in the morning cortisol level of the patients. So this is a non-invasive measure. We ask everyone to give us a saliva sample when they wake up in the morning. And we tested that before and after the music therapy and also before and after the waiting period. And those who uh, waited uh, didn't have any reduction, whereas those who went through music therapy actually have a reduction of their morning cortisol. So it kind of point towards the benefit that music therapy can have some improvement in their stress level and overall um, uh, psychiatric um, symptoms. So I've gone very quickly, and I'll just summarize that. Um, unfortunately, all these uh, randomized controlled trials have failed, but uh, we learn a lot from these uh, uh, trial results. And uh, even just looking at the placebo, um, we learned that maybe we're actually uh, not uh, diagnosing the people properly, so maybe we need to uh, use some better methods to triage the patients to find out who may actually benefit from these uh, potential treatment, and hopefully uh, we will get better treatment. And Alzheimer's disease may be actually more heterogeneous than we think. Um, that's another topic of discussion on another day. And uh, there's a shift to earlier diagnosis and earlier treatment. And in, in the future, biomarkers are probably needed. Um, and in all the current clinical trials, um, everyone will basically be asked for giving biomarkers. So it's either CSF or PET scan. And um, before we have a treatment, there are other interventions that are useful. So don't forget that exercise and listen to music. All right, thank you. Thank you.